um, you are perhaps inter interacting with some of the brands that are walking towards me. Um, first of all, we have Bloomberg. I suppose some of you might watch that news. Um, we have Greg, who's per, per, per possibly single-handedly responsible for my most addictive online experience, which is called High Maintenance. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, from Vimeo, High Maintenance is a show that ha people in this room are watching High Maintenance. Do you know what this is? Greg, you're going to have to Oh, I'll tell them all them. about it. I will okay. tell everybody about it. Don't worry so, about that. Paul, who runs video at Bloomberg and um, is a longtime video expert, Greg, and Emily, who is leading um, video and all kinds of other revenue generating opportunities for Refinery29. Um, and obviously, Rich, who's a wonderful moderator and great analyst. Um, take it away, you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you all for joining us. You know, I, I think the, the big open question is that we're, we've got this explosion of over the top video, and there's so many more consumer choices than ever before. You know, I, I think about how we've evolved, and we started off in a world where video has always been kind of locked, and you basically, whatever a local cable operator or satellite operator offered to you is what you got to enjoy as a consumer. And as Adi just showed, the, the choices for consumers now to consume video, every single day we turn around and we see a new way to consume content, and whether it's premium content or non-premium user-generated content, it's all to the same content to the consumer. And so as we see the bundle starting to crack in the U.S. and we're seeing all these new players, it would be great to maybe get a sense from each of you. What do you think, if, if you're sitting there as a consumer, what does the consumer actually want? What, what, are, what, what are you trying to provide to the consumer in what your own company's video efforts are? You want to start? Yeah, um, I'll speak explicitly on behalf of millennial women because that's really who we program for and who we think about. And... She's a consumer with truly competing needs and desires, which complicates it, but also leaves a lot of more opportunity, which is she wants things on demand. She wants them explicitly the moment that that spark of desire happens. So you have to make it very easy for her to find that thing. But she also wants to be sort of led on um, a voyage. She wants to discover. So it's a matter of programming to her based on time of day, based on the platform she's on, and understanding sort of those secondary cues she shares about what you can give her. So some things are discovery and some things are more in response to a direct demand. Vimeo, so, other than high maintenance, what else are you giving? Or what do you, what do you think the consumer wants? Obviously, well, every consumer in this room just wants more high maintenance. Um, which, which you'll be able to get on HBO. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the explosion of, uh, of video forms and, and, and formats and the explosion of the creation of video in different ways, um, obviously it has never been a more exciting time to sort of be in video. And, and consumers across the board um, seem to want various different things. But, but one of the things that we focus on is, is if you look at sort of one end of the spectrum, right, and you look at uh, kind of Netflix, um, or Hulu, what you've got is, is, for lack of a better word, Hollywood content, right? It's, like, sure. it's, it's the new girl, right, and, and Hollywood films. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got YouTube, um, which is everything. It's everything under the sun. Uh, YouTube, uh, you know, generally ad-supported um, and can be sort of tough to, to, to make a buck there um, unless you're, you know, really one of the top creators on the Netflix side uh, and, and you look at, like, Hulu Plus, it's generally subscription. Um, in the middle... Right? What we're finding is a, a vast quantity of high quality premium video um, that, that it's hard to find at either end of the spectrum that consumers are actually willing to pay for. Right? It, it, there's a, you know, one of the... And, and by pay for, let's just be explicit, meaning transactionally I mean, pay transactionally for. Pay for. I, mean, I mean, this film costs $5 to rent, or this thing costs you know, $2 to buy, or I can subscribe for $2 a month to this particular, uh, this particular creator. Um, you know, one of the things that we you know, sometimes hear about millennials is, is wow, well, you know, they, they don't want to pay for anything. We find that's not true. We find they don't want to pay for what they don't want to watch. You talk about unbundling, you can find... Or, or what they aren't watching they and, aren't and have watching. been paying for anyway. Right. No, I look, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but content that they do want to watch, content they can't find anywhere else, especially content that is sort of highly tailored towards you know, vertical interests, you know, action sports videos, for example, or even within that, surfing videos, um, we find people uh, young and old do pay for. And, and we've been you know, focused on that part of the market. And Paul, you bridge the gap. I mean, so you're the panelist that kind of comes from both worlds. You're distributing through the traditional ecosystem, but also going out onto your own. And kind of how does that fit into the lens of 
this concept of giving consumers what they want? Well, I'll speak on behalf of Bloomberg and then add some thoughts that are more in a mass market. But in terms of Bloomberg, people want expertise and they want to know uh, the full perspective, the full story, like they do for any news story, but it has added depth when it's moving markets, such as uh, what we cover at Bloomberg. And, and that perspective comes in many different levels of production quality and can be delivered just as easily on mobile as it can be delivered through your set-top box and your 50-inch you know, screen. Uh, and so to that extent, th th that accessibility is, of course, key to our users. Uh, beyond that, I think people want connections still. And that you know, hits the left end of the spectrum that, that Clement and Greg sorry, just described, as well as the right end of the spectrum as well. And, and I think that that holds true, whether it's tentpole content that you see uh, the Netflix and the uh, increasingly Amazon and, and HBO uh, creating these must-watch super premium opportunities out there, as well as sports, but also something just uh, as much as true about the cashier. And, uh, and I think that those connections are what's going to build a foundation for, uh, for these new experiences moving forward. But when I think about you know, millennials, let alone everyone beyond just millennials, uh, you know, watching TV ads seems kind of an archaic habit increasingly. And so, you know, in a world where nobody wants to waste time watching ads, just like they don't want to pay for things they don't watch, you know, we've got models like Netflix where there are no ads, Amazon where there are no ads, Greg's model where I'm paying discreetly to avoid advertising. Is there a future for video advertising? I mean, I think the truth of the matter is that brands underwrite incredible content and they have since the TV set was turned on, right? So the idea that we are going to continue to be able to create content that has the quality and quantity that we see today without advertisers in the model is unrealistic. I think the mechanism through which that advertiser message is delivered changes for sure. So meaning I won't have to watch 30 second spots with right. cars driving around mountains. Right. So a lot of the conversation about you know, around viewability right now and all of these things that I think we're all a little bit in a frenzy about goes away when you start solving for the real problem, which is millennials in particular are blind to those banners. They find a way to get around, around that message. So baking it in and making it less like a commercial and more like a service using data and better creative, I think is probably the future and not so far off. And that's, and that, that, that's um, how we work with advertisers. For the most part, yes, our business is a premium business. Um, that being said, and we don't have ads. We don't have pre-roll ads in front of our videos. Um, but, but we do work with advertisers to create original, original content. Um, and and you know, we find advertisers from, you know, from Intel to, to, to American Express to whomever who are interested in creating, now in our case, it's often you know, short films, and, and they're interested. How, in, how hard is that for the brands to do at scale? Um, I mean, it's hard. It, it's not, it, it, it is much easier to scale a pre-roll buy, for, yep. for, for certain. Um, and, and look, there's obviously still tremendous value in, in television advertising. I mean, what is it, over 83% of primetime schedule is still watched live, for, for better or worse, and, and you can't launch a film, uh, a major motion picture, without you know, a TV buy where there's a big, beautiful trailer that is, you know, um, that, that, that fills the screen. Um, but there are an increasing number of advertisers um, who are in the content creation business. Everybody always sort of points to, like, Red Bull as an example of someone who's been doing it for a long time. But, but there are a lot of others. I mean, Marriott, for example, the hotel chain, has a content studio, right? And they make short films, and they, and they, they you know, produce content. There's, like, there's a, a, another uh, major CPG company that's about to launch one. And, and it, it is, it, to your point about doing it at scale, it, it does take you know, time and, and effort uh, to, to create content, whether you're a brand or whether you're an individual creator. Um, but we're seeing uh, sort of a flood of brands move into that space. I think you guys are, are seeing the same on, on your end, for sure. You know, I, I don't think there's uh, any underestimating, uh, or overestimating, I should say, about how much attention is being added to the world through through the mobile experience and it was captured a bit in one of the prior presentations just in terms of how much uh, viewing time we're all experiencing. I, you know, I got a six plus. I don't know if anybody else has, has done that yet. I got it because of my increasingly weak vision, but uh, it's now my first screen. I watch more sports on the six plus. I watch more content, more video on the six plus than uh, on, on any other screen that I have. And 
at that massive scale, I don't see any other path that wouldn't include video advertising in the you know molecular form of the 15 second mid roll pre roll wherever the thing sits uh, that that is just an entry point for virtually any advertiser and certainly something that can be addressed within virtually any context whether it's uh, you know a, a live streaming personal service or uh, some sort of premium destination environment and and so I, you know the, the marketers are not going to abandon their 60 year love affair with video uh, anytime soon, and that's always going to yield exciting opportunities for folks who want to get content out there. Evan picked an awesome week for this event because it comes just after the new fronts and just after the TV upfronts, and so we got to listen literally last week to a whole host of television executives explain why they shouldn't buy digital. You had a great video on that, your little they, they, mashup. They have, they, they have literally explained why buying Refinery29 content or Vimeo content or any of these people's content, um, generically, the online world is a mistake. Um, from viewability to it's non-premium to I could go through a whole host of issues. Uh, it was like the 10 plagues of online video last week of why TV should continue to be uh, a little past Cowboy, cowboy math. One cowboy math was, I love that. was Turner. No, but I mean, literally, they're trying to convince an entire world of ad buyers of why not to shift dollars to digital and mobile, what's, what, what are they, A, what are they so afraid of, and B, what should the, the brands know when they think about the comparison between TV and digital? What can you do that they can't, or does it not even matter? <laughs> well, no, look, I, the, the, after, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the, the, it's kind of a big, fat softball. No, but the, 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 there was... There are there are sellers of of uh, sort of linear media that that are more or less that at least seem or sound more or less scared. I agree. When I watched that video that you that, that you had on your site, um, it, it, it was it seemed odd to have a, you know, a seller come up and say, you know, don't buy digital. Um, that being said, one of the things that that I think a lot of them were alluding to is the fact that the the, the viewability issue, right, when it comes to online uh, video and online ads in general, which is a real one. Right? I mean, I understand that, that when there's a television ad in your house and you're, when you're watching it, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily sitting in front of the TV. You, well, even if you're sitting in front of the TV, I bet you might Emily's have... audience is staring at their phone even if the TV's yeah. on. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I saw some ridiculous statistic about millennials. I, I don't think there's a millennial who watches television without a phone in their right, hand. It's a 60%, like the latest official stat that comes out of, I think Comscore did a companion viewership, mm -hmm. is 60, but for our users, we just did an audience survey, 77% oh, yeah. of them are actively looking at the content from the content, like from the same provider they're watching the show of. And, and, and one of, yeah, so that's I, funny because I saw a number that was closer to that. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, and look, digital advertising is addressable, right? It's, it's, it's targetable, it's addressable. It's, it, you can say, I want to buy just this demographic, psychographic in this geographic market at this time. Who has already seen something else, the retargeting, right? Oh, if they watched a video on this, well, then I'd like to catch them you know, doing that. Um, and that is not technology that exists for broadcast television as yet or for, um, you know, even really for cable and you were just beginning to see it in VOD. Um, I think you'll see more of that technology creeping into those other, to those other channels. I think and you have to. I think there are, some, uh, there are some cable programmers right now who already can say, oh, so X amount of the people who watch this show that you advertised in bought your product on Saturday night. Um, but it is, it, it, it's this sort of um, the, 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 the data scientists have, have had, who are in this space have had their focus on digital media, digital video. Um, now, it's, it's incredibly uh, uh, trackable, it's incredibly programmable. Um, there's also no short of, of inventory. There's no, so the, a, 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 the, the whole concept of I have to buy this show because there's only so many slots doesn't exist. You know, there's no scarcity. Um, so you, you've got all this great targetable stuff at lower CPMs versus non-targetable at, at, at much higher CPMs, and we're going to, I think, see that balance. Is that really true, Paul? I mean, do you think there really is no scarcity online, or do you think key sites, whether it's Bloomberg or whether it's Facebook, or will we see certain sites Except actually... Except for Refinery and Bloomberg. I mean, obviously. <laughs> obviously. No, yeah. I, I, but I'm saying yeah. like, w the web is a very big open place with a lot of scary, you know, corners, and, you know, I think will we see a differentiation... Uh, of mobile destinations, 
where there's winners and losers, or will it be just there's so much supply that, as Greg's talking about, that we just see CPMs just fall lower and lower because it's all generic? It, look, I, I don't think anything is... I'm over-exaggerating. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, yeah, Greg didn't say it's all generic, but, yeah, but un unquestionably... We're Except saying, for Vimeo. Vimeo is distinct. <laughs> yes, Vimeo, Refinery, and Bloomberg are your only three buys. Tell, <laughs> tell any friends in the ad business. Um, yeah, look, I think that we have... Uh, if, if something is exploding, that means the inventory is exploding along with it. So what, what is going to, to create some scarcity out there in the marketplace? And I, I would say that certainly... You, you can look at the halo effect of certain contexts, and that's what so many TV buyers continue to, to you know, it's, it's not just the great demos that they've got. It's also the fact that the show is great, and the, the buyers like the, the actors, and ultimately it's a, it's a good context for their brand. Uh, and so certainly the content halo is, and context halo is always going to be important. But I do think that, yes, there, despite this explosion, there will always be audiences that are particularly valuable to a particular marketer. Ours is certainly one of those for many, many marketers. And there are, of course, others. Uh, young millennial women is, is, of course, going to be incredibly popular and, uh, and something where, where advertisers are going to find, a, at times, a scarcity of the right context with the right audience and uh, perhaps you know at the right reach which uh, you know sports is live sports has obviously continued to succeed with uh, you know to, at this point so and, and context matters it's interesting cuz one of the messages from uh, broadcasters is that context matters and that's also true online to your point yeah. i mean it, it, it's you know when i was at, at at news corp people would buy in the wall street journal cuz it was the wall street journal mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, you, you wanted can, to be attached to that brand. You want, right. you, you want, um, you, you know, you've, you've got, you've got a play, or you've got, you've, you've got a media property. Having an ad in the Sunday Times, right? Even though you can programmatically buy against that audience on multiple different platforms, if you want, you can buy them when they're on, you know, uh, uh, Crack.com, whatever, if you want to. But, but, but people don't. I mean, they do. Right, they sort of you do both, right? You kind of supplement that with the, the programmatic buy, but you wanted the New York Times because you want it around the other content that's in the New York Times. The neighborhood matters, and that's that is true in the digital space as well. And so, Emily, how does that play out as you think about distributed video versus video on your own site? You know, the, the traditional media space is basically, you know, I think about it as you know, you want to watch our content, you come to our channel or our place and our app, and it's it's all about them. You see a few examples of things like John Oliver puts his content out or um, Jimmy Fallon puts his content out. And you see huge success when people do that, but just given the way the money works in the traditional TV space, there really isn't much of a distributed ecosystem. How do you think that evolves online? Like how important is being Refinery29 the destination in the context of Refinery29 versus Refinery29 content being everywhere across the web? I mean, in our opinion, that train's left the station. So if you're chasing people to bring them back to your owned and operated property, you've probably already lost a really significant opportunity with that user. Um, so there's two, there's two use cases, of course. There are instances where it makes a lot more sense to watch something like a long-form video that's a look at trendsetters in Tehran. That's a documentary that we're making now. Um, there's content that compa there's companion content that goes with that articles with in-depth profiles on these women. It makes a lot more sense to watch that on Refinery Twenty Nine, but something like Cut Above. Cut Above is a stop motion life hack series we do that has sort of universal beautiful graphics on things like how to cut a pineapple or how to open a bottle of wine with a blowtorch, which you guys should all Are we going to do that afterwards? That sounds like an awesome post-panel demo. In case I want to see you do it. A wine opener. <laughs> Grab your closest blowtorch. Um, but the idea being you can watch those in their entirety inside the Facebook environment and understand the R29 brand huh? with the convenience of staying on Facebook where the conversation's happening and share that with your friends in a really native way. So... I think for us, we're looking at a social mobile world, mobile world where we understand if trying to get her back to our, you know, our place is probably not the best way to become um, her most trusted source for premium content. But if I look at something like uh, Facebook right now, uh, unlike YouTube where there's true view and there's ads, right now on Facebook, everyone's uploading content essentially for free. Yeah. There's yep. no monetization. Well, I mean, the assumption is there will be, though. No, I understand, but, I, but when talking about distributed networks, right now Facebook's got an awesome model. They sell ads all around the content and make 100% of the revenue and don't share it. I mean, it's... 
a great model for Facebook. <laughs> it's a good model for them. Yeah, yeah but, I, but I, look, I think that the understanding is that there will be, and the sort of rumblings that you hear are that there, there, there will be. Now, you're right. Today, there's not, and they, they make and keep everything. But I, you know, cut to a year from now or even six months from now, I don't think that'll be true. I think Facebook's candidly saying that they're rewarding great content creators and they want people to come there and use that as part of their business model. So to align with you, I doubt that they're not, they don't have something up their sleeve to make that work. Is, is YouTube, I guess as you all think about it, I mean, YouTube is this gorilla in the room in terms of video, massive scale, global, every, I mean, probably every single person in this room has got a YouTube app on multiple devices they own, including what's in their pocket in terms of a phone. Is YouTube friend or foe to your business? You know, how do you look at the, the, the importance or, you know, is, is YouTube scary because they have too much control or a big opportunity? Uh, you know, I, I would look at f Facebook and, and YouTube and say that Facebook with 3 billion streams a day uh, has become a gorilla, you know, virtually overnight. And I think that that is, both of them are exciting. And frankly, it's exciting to have two gorillas. Uh, you know, I think an important point of distinction is that, uh, you know, these, the, historically from a video distribution perspective, if you're doing a deal with the MVPDs, you know, the Comcast of the world, you know, they had a different revenue stream. And instead, here, we're actually turning to businesses for distribution of our content that are advertising companies as well. And in many cases, collect better data for the sale than we're able to collect from the platforms on which we sit. Uh, I think that the fact that, we, that there are bigger options, or I should say a couple of big options right now, is, is good for content producers. Uh, I think a key thing for content producers and what historically YouTube allowed and what Facebook doesn't so much allow is that you have a better predictability in YouTube of, of how your user is going to find you. And the challenge within Facebook is that based on the incredible success of the, the algorithms driving the feed, that's not always correct. And, uh, and if you're looking for any sort of marketing channel, predictability is uh, a key uh, variable that, that you need to track to succeed. But Greg, you made the comment before that most people aren't making much money well, on so, YouTube. So how do you tie back to... So it's interesting, well, uh, by, by the way, I've been really enjoying watching the artist yeah, the draw the gorilla <laughs> under YouTube and Facebook uh, <laughs> behind us. It's really... Um, He's, he's getting it. Um, anyway, the, uh, so, so one of the things that, that, uh, that, that Adi talked about in the last uh, presentation, he showed a couple of YouTube creators um, who are making more money doing live streaming on, on Show You, or, or you see people doing, making more money uh, selling T-shirts. You see people who are uh, making more money. In our case, uh, there are YouTubers who will have a few hundred thousand views per, per video, which is a lot, right? But at a two dollar CPM, and then with forty five percent taken off the top into the sell through, they don't. They're not making a lot of revenue at that at that level. Um, now, YouTube is uh, some of the larger MCNs are when they kind of add all of that up. You can also sell for higher CPMs. Um, you know, when you guys and you guys are on YouTube, you're not selling at a two dollar CPM. Um, but but the, the 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 you know other than the top, I don't know what the number is. Hundred, few hundred thousand. You know, a few thousand creators. Um, it, it, it can be tough, but as a place to, to uh, as a social network, right, as a place to build an audience, to build a fan base, to learn a craft, um, maybe you make it up into that category and you are making real money in advertising, or maybe you get a show on E, right, or maybe you uh, decide, you know, there's, there's a YouTube creator, uh, Comic Book Girl 19, she's awesome, she does these 40 minute uh, videos, uh, 30, 40 minutes that she sells uh, on, on Vimeo to her, her crowd. And in general, I mean, if you've got hundreds of thousands of followers and you can convince 10,000 of them, you know, to spend 10 bucks on something, that, that is, you know, significant revenue for, for those types of creators. Or does it just force the brands to integrate themselves into the content so that that goes everywhere and there's no need for a separate monetization mm -hmm. mechanism? And Emily's shaking her head, so explain, what have sure. you done right. that kind of fits into that world? Um, well, 60% of the actual revenue that we create is is directly linked to custom content, which means the brand is actually our partner in creation of that content. So give the audience an idea of like what's one of the best examples of where, you know, it not only went viral but really resonated with what you're trying to do in terms of branded content or co content. I mean, there's content. so many there's so many great examples, but for video, like we sell a program called Beauty Prep School every mm -hmm. single time we make it. And Beauty Prep School is literally a video that is under a minute that uses one product 
integrated to do a look. And it's something as simple as how to get the perfect wet bun. I find it incredibly useful myself. <laughs> I mean, just speaking as a consumer. This is when your hair was long. <laughs> exactly. When I had hair. Yeah. I remember. The idea is it's really simple. It's something people yeah. really want to watch. You need a product. You would need a product whether or not, you know, P&G was sponsoring it. But because P&G is sponsoring it, we spend more time with them thinking about how that product's cast in the content. We would never do a piece of video that they asked for if it didn't resonate with our user and we thought it was really going to perform. So sort of a win-win, which is a little bit of an easier instance. There's plenty of complicated ones that don't go as well. So, you know, you're constantly learning and, and learning with the brand. We have lots of brands who take risks with us and are willing to... Experimenting, you know, essentially. Yeah. I mean, we're doing a really incredible program with um, Method Hand Soap, hmm? which will we include buy. original content. Um, and it's a, a different approach for us. We don't necessarily always talk to our user in this way. It's a different approach for them. And we, we you know, sort of had to... To learn together as we've developed it, but it's it looks beautiful. We have like four or five minutes left. Questions from the audience before I keep asking. Anyone with questions before I keep going? Evan, I'm trying. So I sat here and kept telling myself, I wish there was a pill that would kill all millennials. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> and he wants I a mean, pill that kills millennials. Okay. I mean, that would have been useful last week at the Upfronts. Uh, um, so most of the stuff I heard is specifically about, and the talk before about video streaming, and um, when you guys are targeting, uh, especially the young female millennials, when you're targeting them, you do these uh, user, I guess, analytics or whatever, how you're getting your data to find out about their personal traits and so on. Um, are you actually doing one-on-one -on -one tests with them? Like, do you ever talk to young millennials as the young female millennials in your case? I mean, we spend 24 hours a day programming for her, so the data you're right is, is our primary filter, but if you walk into the office of Refinery29, it is two men and 200 millennial women. Okay. You so. should really visit that office, by the way. <laughs> I'm going later I'm today. Just you. Everybody come on by. It's worth, it's worth going. No, I exagger I'm exaggerating, but yes, you know, we definitely lean on our own staff to be sort of ear to the ground. And then we just finished a six-month um, insights sort of study that was custom custom funded by us we went into the homes of millennial women so we do more broad editorial scrapes but actually the best most candid conversation we have with them is in our comments um anyone who has seen any of the videos that we created about transgenders in america um the comments are very powerful very opinionated and they say everything about how our users feel about that video the reason I asked was, um, I mean, for example, Vimeo has been you know, long, around longer than YouTube, right? And has been some couple of months longer or something like that. <laughs> um, and I mean, I think I've been watching Vimeo footage, you know, v Vimeo content for years now. And it's the highest quality, Thank beautiful, etc. right? And it comes out that I'm actually a millennial. Uh, but I, anything you when, guys were When did you discover you were a millennial? <laughs> <laughs> I had to Google the dates, actually, just now to find, to find out if I'm a millennial or not. Um, but anything that I've been hearing today uh, concerning millennials specifically, it's just like it flies over me, right? Uh, and Vimeo, for example, for me, is not targeted towards millennials. Are you guys thinking that you're creating, your users create content that's just good content, like we're a photo company, so we like good content, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's funny that, that, that our filter is, is, is sort of, you know, great content, you, you know it when you see it. It, it. We're not necessarily targeting content towards uh, millennials or any... My mom uh, well, that's uh, awesome. Um, I thank your mom for me. Um, but, She's but, not a millennial. Um, but, but when we, I think one of the reasons that, that we talk about millennials uh, so much is when we're up here or in the upfronts or in the new fronts, um, is because of advertisers and because that is the main 
group that advertisers are targeting and that's such a large percent of the population. But, but the content that we have on Vimeo, I, to your point, um, is all, I mean, there's, there's heartbreaking documentaries and, and there are instructional yoga videos and yeah, there's YouTubers who are creating content and selling it too, but, but, but it's, it's really across the board. It's not targeted necessarily toward any one demographic. Any last questions from the audience? Or oh, one more? Can we take one more? Yes. Now, that, now that you incited everybody. Yeah, go, go, go. In the back, back left. No, 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 no. Now use a mic for the video. Good. There you go. You're going to be famous for this question. Depends on the question. Uh, so my question is, in the linear world, we have Nielsen as the basic currency of uh, advertising and measuring it. And how close do you think the online world is to agreeing on a standard metric or are we never going to get there because you're going to have different metrics catered to different audiences? Oh, Emily's excited to take this one, I can tell. Online metrics for monitoring or monetizing uh, eyeballs. Um, I think first is agreeing upon a model that you would actually measure. So right now there's so many experimental models around the monetization of video that are being developed in real time. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it today. There was a, a great Digiday article about all of the different ways that publishers, new media publishers, they use Mike as an example, they're first creating hits and then they're sort of retrofitting what the ad model to that hit would be based on how people are watching it, where they're watching it, and what they're doing with that content. So until we agree upon a model, I think it's really hard to say there's going to be some uniform agreement on measurement. Yeah, it's all over the map, I think is what you're saying. Yes, that's what I was saying. I think that about wraps it up because we're over our time slot. And I'll turn it back over to Evan and thank you to the panelists. This was great. Thank you. And I like the bottom line. Thank you very much. And we agree on.